Good morning, Mr. Secretary. We have quorum. Good morning and welcome to the Anne Arundel County Delegation Meeting. I'm Delegate Heather Bagnell, Chair of the Delegation with Vice Chair Delegate Dana Jones. Before we conduct further introductions, I would ask everyone to welcome Delegate Seth Howard, District 30, who will be offering our pledge and our prayer today. So, hold on, I'm pulling it up now. Okay. There we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. You want me to do prayer now? Go ahead. We can yeah. hear you now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Did you did we totally miss the pledge? Did I totally we, we the heard pledge? the first part of it, but we were all we were all uh, lip syncing along with you. Oh, all right, that's fine. Gracious Lord, remind us of the importance of keeping the promises we have made to each other and to you. Teach us that the obligations that it that have taken up we have taken upon ourselves cannot be forgotten or overlooked. Show us that the only way to honor our obligations to, is to live in harmony with them on a daily basis. Guide us in the responsibilities which are ours as we assemble here to conduct our business today. In your spirit, we pray, amen. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go ahead and welcome all of our senators, uh, Senator Don Guile from District 33, Senator Pam Beidel, District 32, Senator Brian Simonair, District 31, Senator Sarah Elfrith, District 30, Senator Jim Rosa Pep, District 21, and Senator Clarence Lamb of District 12. Um, just for, for our viewers, uh, some of our members are a little under the weather today, so they are participating, but we'll be keeping their cameras off, but they are here serving their constituents. We really appreciate your participation. And we remind everyone, it is still cold and flu season. COVID is still hanging on, so please try and, and get sleep, drink your fluids, take your vitamins, take care of yourself. Mom, chair, woman would like to, to see you all healthy and well. Um, I want to go ahead and welcome our guests. Uh, the Anne Arundel County chapter of the AARP is once again watching uh, from the live stream. And I also want to recognize our council, Matt Carpenter, our delegation secretary, Roger Massey, my Chief of Staff, uh, Rory Nolan, and Josh Paper, Chief of Staff to Vice Chair Jones, who are providing technical support for the meeting today. As a reminder, all delegation meetings will be on Zoom due to space constraints. With that, I would love to welcome Superintendent Mark Bedell and President uh, Dr. Joanna Tobin of the uh, Anne Arundel County Board of Education. Dr. Tobin, uh, and welcome all of our board of ed, uh, members. Dr. Tobin, if you would like to introduce your members and the rest of the team. Absolutely, I'm delighted to do so. Thank you again for inviting us. We're thrilled to be here. Thank you, Delegate Bagnell. Okay, I've just been spotlighted, so I can't see who else is on. So I'm hoping I get this right. <laughs> all right, I see Ms. Ellis from District 4. I see Ms. Corkadell from District 7. I see Ms. Schalheim from District 5. I see Vice President Robert Silkworth from District 2. And of course, Dr. Bedell is on, as you noted, and our uh, acting legislative and policy specialist, Ms. Grace Wilson, who I believe many of you have met at this point is also on. And of course, uh, Bob Mosier, our um, chief communications officer is on. I believe, I don't believe I've missed anyone. Please wave at me if I have. Um, and so thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, and uh, if I may, can I go ahead and say a couple of things before Absolutely. Thank you. Thank All right. you for being here today. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. We're very, very grateful uh, for the continued partnership. Um, and I have to say, I'm especially also want to uh, mention our gratitude. We had such a wonderful turnout at our legislative breakfast a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and that's 
terrific because as I said, we, we do all of this together. And so the partnership from all of our uh, legislative members as well as county and, and local was tremendously helpful. Um, obviously this is, partnership is a theme as we continue to move education forward in this county. Uh, we're at a critical moment now coming out of COVID as everybody understands and facing a number of challenges moving forward. But, uh, and many reach out to us constantly asking how we can help. And I do wanna highlight something. I know Delegate Bagnell, you were at this event along with some of your colleagues last week, uh, was it last week? <laughs> I've lost track of days, uh, where Dr. Bedell introduced a new initiative called Hashtag Be Present. Um, reaching out to the community, asking for help from the community to be in schools with our students, to help our students understand that the community is there to support them. We're asking for volunteer time in the morning when students come in, in the afternoon when they leave, during lunchtime, whatever will work for the community. And what is driving this, quite frankly, is uh, some very important and um, possibly you know, concerning data that Dr. Bedell put out at the press conference. And I wanna to reiterate today, um, we are currently on track to double the number of serious offenses reported by st of students from last year, and similarly to double the number of reports of weapons in school from last year. Now, for some context, the, um, the serious offenses involves about 2.5% of our students. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 98% of our students are doing the right thing, right? Similarly, the weapons reports involve something like 0.1% of our students. So the vast majority of our students are, are coming to school and doing what students do every day and what we hope they do every day. The problem is, one event is too many. And so I wanna be very clear, I, I, I applaud Dr. Bedell for, um, for putting this data out there because he continues to be, I think one of the most transparent superintendents uh, in the state, quite frankly, possibly beyond. But I think uh, to put a finer point on it, um, no one should be unaware that we are putting this data out and that we are flashing some red signals here. And we need the help of the community to support our students to be added eyes and ears in the school building and to offer community support. As I said, as Dr. Bedell said, we can't do this alone as a school system. So we welcome your continued partnership. We're grateful for it. We hope you will let your constituents know about this program and about our ask for their help. And not just now, as an ongoing aspect of how we expect and hope to move education forward. Um, so with that, thank you for a couple of moments. I would love to turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Bedell. All right, thank you, Dr. Tobin. And, and good morning to all of our delegates who are um, on this morning. Thank you for giving us this, this platform. And um, just one, one piece of information that I think is important for you all uh, before I get into the two priorities. A couple of weeks ago, we had a retreat, a Saturday retreat with the board. And we are beginning to have conversations about um, things that we wanna look at doing a little bit different uh, next year. One of those items does impact our elected officials, and that's the putting together our legislative plat uh, platform. And so this year, we our board took a, a vote in December. And as you all know, session opens up a few weeks later. What we want to do differently is to work with our school board, to collaborate with our school board, to kind of have a recap of this, this session uh, sometime during the month of June. So it's almost like a workshop type event that we would do. And then also get together and 
make a decision on what will our platform be for the upcoming session. Our goal is to want to try to get the board to vote on our agenda by the end of August. So that gives us multiple months to, to be able to work with you all to make sure that we have the right language, that everybody has a thorough understanding of the direction we want to head in and how will this impact our school district from a long-term standpoint. So that is one change that will be uh, implemented with the upcoming year. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, <clears throat> Then let's just talk about the uh, priorities real quick. And uh, we came up with two because in my in my years of, of doing this work, um, I've always told our board just we should focus on just a few things that we can really put all of our efforts in and then begin to add on in the future. So flexibility in the school year is number one, and it's probably it's an extremely critical one for us. Um, as we discussed at the legislative breakfast, AACPS has, has pursued legislation this session that will remove artificial scheduling constraints and increase flexibility for school systems to tailor instructional programs and operations to innovatively best meet the needs of our students. So uh, coming from the state of Missouri, we are on in our system. So it allows for us to do things that right now, quite frankly, we can't do here in the state of Maryland. Um, there are a number of you who have agreed to sponsor this legislation on behalf of the school district. We have Senator Beidel, Delegate Jones, Delegate Bagno, uh, Delegate Chisholm, Delegate Henson, Delegate Prusky, Delegate Rogers, and Delegate Smith. And so we're just thankful for all of the support um, and so here's what the current law requires. It requires that schools be in session for both 180 days and a minimum number of seat hours, 1,080 at the elementary and middle school levels and 1,170 at the high school level. Senate Bill 321 and its cross file, House Bill 510, public schools length of school year and innovation school scheduling models the revisions will allow AACPS and other school systems to meet the number, the minimum number of seat hours required while removing the constraint that these seat hours be met during a 10 month period over the course of a school year at at least 180 days. So here's what's important. This change would not mandate that any school system alter current operations in any way and would not reduce instructional time for students in any of our school districts. School systems will still be required to meet the minimum, the existing minimum number of seat hours for all students. But what it will do for us is it will allow for us to pursue innovative school scheduling models that we would engage our community around, um, including looking at year round schooling or where applicable a four day school week as an example. We also know that in some of our communities, as I've said in a number of our listening and learning tours, part of the reason why we're interested in looking at a trimester type schedule is because the longer students are away from us during the summer, the more harm that's conducted to those students. Hence the learning regression and learning loss that tends to happen over a two and a half month period when they're not with us. And we just believe that um, this would better serve some aspects of our community. So I am very thankful for your partnership and support in pursuing this matter on behalf of AACPS. And as I've said to people, I've given several ideals of what innovation could look like. It's not limited to the ideals that I have presented to people in this community over the 16 listening and learning tours. Um, there are going to be ideals that communities will come up with that they think will best work for them. What I'm trying to do is to get everybody to understand that the cookie cutter approach is no longer relevant, that many of our school districts in the United States are obsolete, we're outdated and we're very rigid because we have to operate within these constraints, to me, that contradict what the Maryland blueprint is calling for us to do. And we understand that even if we're not able to do this statewide, I don't, you know, could it be done for our school district 
just like we've been able to pass legislation in, in Missouri that generally impacted Kansas City public schools because of the uniqueness of what we had to operate within. Um, and then the second one is the construction funding for pre-K expansion. This is to ensure funding to allow for the construction of safe and supportive environments to pre-K students without sacrificing space elsewhere in school facilities. This, there's some context here. The mandated move to full day kindergarten in 2017 was not accompanied by sufficient funding. And it took our school district 15 years to obtain funding for and construct ad adequate classroom environments for those students without utilizing space intended for other students. A repeat of that scenario runs contrary um, to the goals of Blueprint, MSDE, and local school system. So those are the two items that we are interested in, in, in pursuing this year. And we look forward to working with you all throughout the duration of this session. And I don't know if there's any questions for President Tobin or myself. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent. I did also want to recognize um, uh, Gloria Dent, school board member Gloria Dent from District 1 has joined, joined our, our uh, call. And did I have questions from the members? It looks like you did an extraordinary job because we do, we have no questions. Um, I just wanted to, oh, oh uh, we have a, a, a hand from Senator Vidal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna thank Dr. Bedell for the work that he's done in this short period of time, uh, visiting all of our schools, listening to the parents and educators and proposing some new solutions. So Dr. Bedell, thank you for everything you've done. We, we appreciate having you. Thank you, Senator. And uh, Delegate Rogers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Bedell, always great to hear from you and uh, President Tobin. Um, so earlier this week, I met with um, several folks from uh, TAC, mm -hmm. and they were still studying uh, the proposal that you just talked about. So my question is, have you had a chance to engage in, in conversation and dialogue with TAC? Because I know, you know, information is power and to the extent that they understand, you know, what this legislation means, you know, maybe they're, they're able to be supportive of it. Yeah. I, well, TAC, I have met with TAC about this. I have, uh, TAC representatives have been at the vast majority of our listening and learning tours. I think they, they have a clear understanding of what we're trying to do. I think, um, you know, this is where it becomes difficult because, it, it, it's not going to look the same across the board. And I think oftentimes what you will have with, with some of your bargaining units is they want consistency because it's a lot easier for them to manage and navigate, you know, what they have to do. And it's no different than as we talk about how we want to give stipends to some of our special education teachers. That kind of poses a problem for the union because at the end of the day, they're saying, well, if you do differentiated pay here, there are going to be other people that want differentiated pay, which honestly... I think it's fine, depending on the, the the critical shortages areas and the type of assignment that people are taking. So I think these are just some of the levels of discomfort that we're just going to have to continue to work through with the union. But have, helping the union understand, like even when we talk about this innovation, it's not like nothing's going to be done without them being at the table, without the community being at the table. Right. If we can innovate like this back in 2011. In 12, when I was in the Houston Independent School District, where we got 215,000 students, and we're able to work with our legislators in Austin to extend the school year for 20 schools, extend the school day for 20 schools, and we're able to offer different types of incentives to get the best teachers in some of those struggling schools, and it paid huge dividends, right? It really did. I, I think we'll be able to do the same here um, because it, it ultimately, if you extend the school day and make it longer, the, the worst that happens is you end up having a longer school day, right? Which doesn't hurt kids that really need that additional time. Um, and then you're paying people for their time. Like nobody will be doing any extra work without without being compensated. So it's just, we'll, we'll continue to work with them through this. 
No, thank you for that answer. And, and it wasn't that they were necessarily in opposition of it. It was that they were trying to fully understand it. That That's all. And it quite possibly could have just been the folks that showed up at my office and maybe some other um, folks from, from TAC do understand it. But thank you for that answer. Yes, sir. Um, Delegate Pena Melnick. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, Dr. Bedell. Good I'm morning. sorry I can't put my um, my video on at the moment, but I wanna congratulate you on your position. And I also would like to just uh, um, offer us as um, you know people that can work with you. I like to encourage you to work with us and let us know uh, how we may be of help and assistance to you as you have these programs and as you um, develop your um, legislative agenda in the future as well. Um, myself, as someone who's a, a Black Latina, um, I'm very interested um, in, in the uh, numbers uh, for all students, um, but also for the um, uh, Black and Brown kids and, and the disparities as well. And if we can help um, close um, those gaps, um, please consider us, um, you know, a partner as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. And we will do that. But the, the, the intent of this is to allow for us to be able to look at data, respond to data, and do it in an innovative way that we think will help close gaps, right? But I, I tell people this, when I, I even look at the data at our top in our county, we got to push the top. Because right now, you know, when you only have 39.7% of your kids entering into your school district kindergarten ready, and we don't have a single student group over 50% entering kindergarten ready, right? We're already performing triage on nearly 70, 60% of our kids that can't even access grade level standards um, upon entering kindergarten. So we know that that's why this pre-K piece is critical, getting more exposure but then also then looking at what are different ways that we can provide instruction and potentially change the conditions that will allow for us to not only move this district, but close those gaps. And we think that this, this could help us significantly. Thank you. I agree with you that the data is so important. Um, so thank you so much and congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Lehman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bedell, for um, your creativity and your vision. Um, I, I assure you, if I had known about this piece of legislation, I would happily have signed on to it. Um, what I'm curious about is thinking through the, the flexibility that, um, to, the, to the degree um, uh, county school systems have flexibility under state law, thinking about um, you know, the discussion of the last few years uh, before you were here, of course, about when, um, you know, when to start school in the, in the late summer or early fall, the issues I'm thinking of around, you know, pre-Labor Day, post-Labor Day. Um, so, so counties do have some flexibility, obviously, but what is your understanding of how much flexibility there is around, um, you know, the things you talked about, like, say, a four-day school week? or uh, summer, you know, a year round program for just Dan Arundel um, versus, versus a statewide, um, you know, either more statewide flexibility for all counties or, or going to year round school or a four day school week for, for all counties. I, I just wasn't aware there was that much flexibility, but, but maybe there is. I don't, I don't, that, I think that's the issue right now. There's not a lot of flexibility because you are, even when you think about whether you start pre-Labor Day or after Labor Day, that that's a constraint, right? What if, what, if, what if the decision was with one of our communities that we wanted to really try this trimester schedule and it required that we needed to start, you know, on a cycle of August through November and then the kids get their intercession support during the month of November um, and then everybody's out for Thanksgiving and then you start your second trimester going December through March, right? And then during the month of March, you get your intercession too on standards and things that you didn't learn between December 
and and at the end of February, and and then everybody's out for spring break, and then that cycle runs all the way through the end of June. Everybody's out July, and then you start a new cycle over. You can't do that right now, given some of the statutes that are on the books, right? So we this is just the beginning of that conversation, but it, it's kind of like a school district. You know, you write an overarching equity policy, but you don't ever change the existing policies that are on the books, right? So then people are still operating on policies that are outdated, antiquated, that contradict this new era of a policy. So it's a lot of unpacking that will have to take place. This is just the beginning of it because I'm certain there'll be other constraints that will come up legislatively that we're gonna have to say, we need some, we need some flexibility in order to, to fully accomplish what we want to accomplish. But getting this change does give us a little bit more flexibility on, on things that, that, that we can do in the immediate working with our communities and I, and then it's all Absolutely. about the appetite of the community, right? We, we, we're not going to do anything that we can't have thank, buy thank you so from our community. That. Really quickly, yeah, Delegate back. is this a statewide bill then or a county bill? Um, I, I believe our vice chair has, has the answer. It's in her committee, but um, yeah. my understanding Yes, and I, I'm the sponsor in the House. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, it is a statewide bill. Yep. Great. Okay, well... Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Bedell, for um, for your leadership on this. Yes. Delegate Chisholm, you have the final question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Bedell, for your uh, presentation. You know, I love your compassion or your passion and your, your, your drive to change things here. And when we were talking about the flexible schedule, I know that they do it in North Carolina. I was just curious, did you implement this type of flexible schedule with the trimesters when you were in Kansas City? We were on the verge of doing it. That was part of what our whole Blueprint 2030 initiative was about. We had the same issues. We were locked in on, on days and hours. And then legislation passed uh, probably two years ago or so where we went to hours. So now what you have is a number of school districts in the state of Missouri that are now operating on four day weeks. Um, we were looking at moving towards this. We had explored it. And we realized that there was some constraints and then we had to go and kind of get legislation changed. Um, but I but I did something. I did a year round program. Let me say that it wasn't the model that I wanted. I had to operate within the constraints that were on the books and it right. did. It did not pay the dividends that we wanted it to pay. Yeah, I, I love new ideas, but also sometimes if we can show model legislation that's working in other areas of the country or other counties, and it's always a easier pitch for us. I know that. Okay, and that and, and we can. I mean, I can tell you right now. You can look at the hour system in the state of Missouri and look at a number of school districts that have now moved to different types of, of calendars as a result. Missouri would be a prime example, and if we need to get some data, we can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I want to be cognizant of your time. I know you have you have to to leave, Dr. Bedell, but I didn't I didn't want to um to to have you leave before we commended you and the board on on your hard work, especially throughout uh, this transition. I know you came in uh, you know as we were still uh, dealing with the with the um, the impacts of of COVID and and the shutdown, and um and our board of ed has worked really hard to continue. Um, to 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 innovate and to pivot. Uh, for those who don't remember, the uh, the the uh, the blueprint was based on recommendations from the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education. So I love hearing that word innovation. Um, I did want to let uh, you and the entire board know we have citations to thank you for your work but we want the opportunity to actually present them in person. So we're gonna be, um, be looking to the schedule so that we can actually come and thank you uh, for, for your hard work um, and, and for your innovation and for continuing to work to deliver for, for our, our kids and our, and our constituents. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I want to now turn to uh, to Lead Maryland and introduce Lead Maryland. The Lead Maryland Foundation is a University of Maryland Extension Signature Program. It's dedicated to identifying and developing leadership to serve 
agriculture, natural resources, and rural communities. So welcome, Lead Marin and Marilyn, and thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you for having me. Uh, it's hard to follow a presentation like that for Dr. Bedell. Um, you know, switching, switching and pivoting from, from our kids, which uh, I have two children that are in the Anne Arundel County public school systems and have been doing quite well. So I appreciate your efforts on that front. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Greg Sandy. I uh, work for the Maryland Department of the Environment. I'm a Crofton resident and uh, I was uh, unfortunately educated in the Frederick County public school system. So uh, I am a product of Western Maryland, um, but I've been living in Anne Arundel County for the last roughly 20 years of my life. And uh, I've been at the Department of the Environment for about 13 years. And I um, do a lot of work with our Chesapeake Bay restoration. Uh, program and uh, non-point source pollution mitigation and restoration. So um, very, very keenly aware of a lot of the, the issues that we have going on within the state and globally in terms of natural resources and um, the, 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 the issues that, that are going on there and how we may have some better ways of, of moving forward. So let me introduce LEAD Maryland. I was uh, a working with our Department of Agriculture on a number of issues that, uh, that, we, that we, we share in terms of meeting restoration goals and, and working with rural communities. And they introduced me to this LEAD Maryland uh, process, which is a two-year educational fellowship program that's designed to provide new skills and promote leadership within our community. So it includes natural resources, rural community development, and we tour throughout the state to look at both the, um, the different priorities that are seen in both, say the inner cities, the suburbs and the Western Maryland communities, the, the Southern Maryland and South, the, Eastern Shore, we get a, a, a great um, look at what different communities are focused on. So, for example, and it's, you know what what's going on in Anne Arundel is similar, but not the same as what's going on in a Somerset or Pamlico County. And what this does is it allows us to look from a perspective that we have here as a, for me as a civil servant, to be able to communicate with a bunch of other folks in the agricultural community, business owners and independent um, nonprofits and, and, and really connect in a meaningful way and learn how to interact and listen, which is I think the biggest thing that we, we need to learn to do is listen uh, within these communities so that we can be advocates for their needs going forward. Uh, some of the things I, I am required to, to tell you about is uh, how, how this program is funded. It is uh, funded primarily through the agricultural industry uh, grants and the University of Maryland Extension, which is uh, the organization that runs it. We thank everyone who can help us to fund and support programs like this as well as the Maryland Agricultural Education and Rural Development Assistance Fund, the Rural Maryland Com Council, the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and um, I'll put a plug in for my department as well, the Department of the Environment as well. We appreciate your support. Um, we are actually going to be traveling to Panama in the near future to understand resource issues and land use agricultural issues as well that happen on an international level. So it gives us a, a much broader perspective. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me, my father's from Costa Rica. So I've been uh, a resident there in the past for about a year and a half, two years, and um, seen, seen a lot of things from that perspective as well. Uh, so I would be a, a, a doing a disservice if I wasn't an advocate for the program and trying to identify new members. So if anybody has any interest in the program or, or wants, has somebody who might have interest in the program, 
there is a new class being formed now. I am part of class 12, class 13 is coming up and I do advocate for, for folks that are interested to try and participate. We have a big variety of people within our cohort from urban farmers to myself as the Department of the Environment and then um, uh, chicken farmers on the shore and also folks from Garrett County that are participating in uh, forestry. So I wanted to, I don't want to go too much further because I know you all have a lot more interesting things on your on your docket today, but I wanted to thank you for your time and the, the many, the support that has been given to the LEAD program through the legislature and through various uh, grants and, and, and other resources that have been provided us. And um, just wanted to thank you for the time today to, to kind of give you a, an update on the program and I'm very interested if anyone has any questions on it. Well, thank you so much. And, and we are always interested in educational programs and knowing about the resources available to, to our county and our state. So don't ever apologize for taking our time. That's why we're here. We want to know more. Um, I have a, 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 a hand up from uh, Delegate Schmidt. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for uh, being here and for explaining that. I was uh, intrigued to learn more about the agriculture side of that. Um, I, I will tell you, I have a nine year experience from the agricultural uh, world. So if you need something, I uh, spent two years in a chicken farm. So, uh, and uh, last night at the agricultural event, had some great conversations with some previous uh, colleagues and employers. So if there's something that um, I can do for you or share some insight, please let me know. Thank you. Do we have uh, other questions from, from the members? Well, I just wanna thank you for, for coming. And I know I know there's a lot of transition happening at the Department of the Environment. Um, so not only do we want to be partners with LEAD, but we also wanna be good partners with our, with our state agencies because uh, you, you all do, do a lot for, for our state um, and, and uh, you keep us safe, you keep us, uh, you know, informed. And so I really appreciate, we really appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we are going to now turn to our legislative bond initiative presentations. As a reminder to everyone, uh, the it's five minutes per presentation. Um, and to our members, remember to ask your best questions. Remember we don't interrogate our guests. These are often uh, community volunteers and our constituents. Uh, and we will have the opportunity to, to reach out offline for further information. So if, if uh, at the end of the presentations, you feel like you still have some questions that are unanswered, uh, please feel free to, uh, to, to reach out to uh, Roger Massey and to our chair of the Capital Budget Subcommittee for more information, um, and we can get that to you. With that, I'm going to um, turn it over to, to Baldwin Hall. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Please introduce yourselves and, and tell us about your project. Certainly. Um, my name is Annie Medford. I'm the building manager of Historic Baldwin Hall. I'm here with Gail Campbell, one of our trustees. Um, and uh, we are here um, today to um, thank you for the opportunity um, and uh, inform you of the needs of Historic Baldwin Hall uh, located here in Millersville. Um, this building, which you see behind me, um, was originally built in 1861. Um, it has survived being moved twice in its lifetime. It has lived on three of the corners here at the intersection of Generals Highway and Millersville and Indian Landing Roads. It began its life as a church and now serves the community as a location for meetings, um, classes, and private functions such as weddings and family gatherings. Um, we are also serve our community in many other ways. We sponsor a BSA scout troop that has performed 21 Eagle Scout projects on our property. Uh, we're very proud of that and are proud of the work that the Scouts do here. Um, we host the Maryland Mobile Ears and Amateur Radio Group. We have the Chesapeake Harmony Chorus, which rehearses and uh, performs here. Uh, we have a local Hummels Collector Group that regularly meets, as well as the Annapolis Ukulele Group, which comes in um, for regular uh, rehearsals as well. 
So we have many community associations and groups that meet here um, with their organizations as well. In addition, we maintain the 1840s era schoolhouse, um, one room schoolhouse and the Cora Delaney History and Genealogy Library um, as a community resource um, for our public to use as well. At this time, Historic Baldwin Hall is in dire need of restoration for its 21 original 1861 windows, which you see behind me. Um, the restoration includes repairing the rot in the wooden sashes and sills, painting and staining the sashes, sills, and mullions, repairing the operation of the historic pulley systems to open and close those windows, reglazing the glass, some of which are still the antique historic cord glass, um, and adding an exterior storm window system that would help with preservation and insulation. Um, the amount we are requesting is $30,000. Uh, our estimate from a local preservation company indicates that the cost to do those repairs um, for, this, um, uh, for these historic arched windows would be about $20,000. And then in order to protect the windows, the additional cost of those um, acrylic panels um, to be fitted properly would be about an additional $10,000. So this would bring the total to $30,000 for our request. The um, 21 antique windows are tall, narrow, nine over nine, double hung Gothic style sash windows um, with rounded arched headers and louvered shutters. If you're into architecture, you'll know what all that means. Um, the windows are original to the 1861 building and we could never replace them. The key to this is restoration and preservation of these windows. And um, we feel that by being able to do that, we could assist our building and help our building um, to prevent further wood rot, to prevent termite damage, which is a potential and um, keep the entire building um, uh, in a better position and save us also on uh, costs of energy loss through these uh, old windows. So, um, we are very proud of our Severn Crossroads Foundation, which is a nonprofit and um, has preserved this building since uh, 1981. And um, it has managed to run Baldwin Hall independently as a nonprofit organization um, for all of these years, uh, always able to generate sufficient income to maintain and preserve the hall independently. But our request for this funding comes at a perfect confluence of um, loss of income due to COVID, as well as just um, a culmination of some um, desperate needs for these uh, restoration um, and an immediate need for those restoration efforts to repair the windows. So we hope that um, you can help us with our funding and um, be able to help preserve Historic Baldwin Hall as a community treasure in this um, area. Thank you very much. And your timing was perfect. Um, <laughs> so do, do we have questions from the members? Delegate Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Have you all had an opportunity to seek any funding from the Maryland Historical Trust? And if so, were they able to support the project? So um, we're in the process of working with the Maryland Historical Trust right now. Uh, the problem is, is that we weren't included in one of their preservation areas. So um, we're working through that technicality right now and hoping to um, get some funding from them. But we're looking at multiple issues here at the hall, including uh, roof leaking, um, peeling paint on the exterior, um, which is you know, generating wood rot out there. Um, we have some plumbing issues. We have a floor inside that has been sanded down so many times that the nails are starting to protrude. So yes, we are trying to work with other um, funding, but um, we have so many needs that um, we're hoping to focus on with this LBI, focus on the windows as our first priority. Sure, thank you for your preservation efforts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And, and I don't know about the other members, but I want to circle back and learn more about the ukulele group. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Wa Chapel Village Commons. Welcome.
Hi, I'm Tori Jacobson. Um, I'm the director of the uh, Village Commons Community Center. Um, we're at the Village Commons Shopping Center. We're a 5013. Um, our community center was built in 2001 as part of the uh, shopping center um, for the community. We, um, um, it's a 5,000 square foot center with two bathrooms and a, ki a kitchenette. We're not allowed to have any cooking on premise um, because we support the local restaurants um, in the region. Um, they use our center when the parties are bigger than what their establishments are. Um, we have a lot of needs, but we, we have a lot of people in the community using our center. We do uh, HOAs um, meet there. Um, churches use our center um, for, for church. We have uh, the Kiwanis Club. We have the Greater Crofton Council meets there. Crofton Valley meets there. Um, multiple HOAs use us for uh, um, meetings, annual meetings, because we're large enough to hold anything even during COVID um, because of our, our square footage. Um, but our, um, I took the center over about three years ago as general manager and um, maintenance and upkeep was not the, uh, a priority um, in the past. And our bathrooms are outdated. Um, our floors, our tiles are, are um, stained and um, it just is not looking uh, pretty. And um, we are getting a new roof on the center and we need uh, new ceiling tiles. Our floor in the main room, we have to have it cleaned every 30 days because it's carpet and it's not conducive for uh, the use that we that we have there now. Um, we have had uh, um, our kitchenette is uh, um, outdated and because of water leaks in the past, all our, all our cabinets or the wood, pressed wood is falling apart and the cabinets are starting to uh, fall down. We are shovel ready. We do have some cash. We have about $60,000 to put towards the money that we've asked for to do this uh, extensive uh, renovation of the community center. But we are a regional center and we bring thousands of people into the uh, into Anne Arundel County. We support um, hundreds of restaurants that do uh, catering in our center for weddings and parties and stuff. We also, um, the Boy Scouts use it. Um, Grace Bomb did their fundraising there. Uh, we have, uh, um, we do candidates nights. Um, we let the uh, gov the state government and the county government and some elected officials um, have used it to do town hall meetings um, there because it's large enough to uh, to do anything that that you really need. Uh, we have our capacity is over a thousand people, um, so we we have a uh, a great space with plenty of parking at the shopping center, and we do food tasting events, and we just need major upgrade, and we really would help. Love to have your support um, to get some funds so that we can do these upgrades. Any questions? Thank you. And, and it is great to hear from you, Mr. Jacobson. Um, do we have questions from the members? Hearing none, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and I'm well, going thank to. You. Thank absolutely. you for your time. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our final presentation today, Kingdom Care Veterans Resource Center. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, Bishop Antonio Palmer, the uh, senior pastor of Kingdom Celebration Center, uh, mm -hmm. located in Gambrills, Maryland. And um, also, I've been pastoring for 28 years here in the wonderful county of Anne Arundel. <laughs> And um, so we've been doing outreach work uh, for nearly uh, three decades. Um, uh, my wife and I also are the owners of Kingdom Care Incorporated, uh, which is a um, 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, <laughs> whose mission is to empower children youth and families. Uh, and we're located uh, in Odenton, Maryland, and we serve largely the West County uh, area. 
Um, excuse me, I got a little something going on here. Uh, on our property, our current property, uh, we have three buildings uh, that can be utilized for additional services to assist uh, our county, uh, especially where uh, there are uh, gaps in service. Um, we found that there is a great need uh, to help the homeless population in Anne Arundel County. Um, as a veteran, I felt uh, a more specific need uh, to help our uh, displaced military veterans who are displaced um, uh, because they're having a tough time uh, meeting the challenges of life. Uh, so the Veterans Resource Center um, was uh, birthed uh, from that. And um, so our mission for our Veterans Resource Center, before I get into that, let me just share with you a couple of things that um, uh, the Kingdom Care actually uh, some of the programs that we offer now. Uh, so we have uh, our weekly food distribution where we serve over a thousand people uh, on a weekly basis uh, every on every Monday. Um, we also have our teen parent program um, uh, where uh, we're able to um, serve uh, up to 25, I think it's, a, I think it may be about 12 uh, teen mothers who are going through the program now uh, to continue their education um, and uh, to get their high school diploma. Uh, and uh, while their babies are at our child care center, uh, we also have our plug mentorship program, uh, which is in Steel Meadows. Um, and uh, we also work alongside with the health department with the health ambassadors program, uh, helping um, people uh, in uh, the at-risk communities um, to bring uh, awareness about uh, COVID-19 and other uh, health uh, disparities that are in our communities. Uh, and we just started with Pam Brown's office with uh, the Strengthening Families Program. And uh, we just received uh, grant funding uh, for our Violence Interruption Prevention Program uh, that we would be uh, serving the Mead Village, Steel Meadows, uh, and Pioneer City uh, area to help uh, reduce uh, gun violence uh, and any other type of violence uh, in that region. Um, now, back to the Veterans Resource Center. Um, again, I thought as a veteran that it would be um, strategic since we're in a military region uh, to help the homeless uh, population uh, veterans population. So uh, with our, our buildings that are currently at least one of them that we're going to be utilizing, uh, we're going to be able to offer uh, wraparound services, which will include uh, housing and meals for 16 veterans, up to 16 veterans who are displaced. Um, also case management, uh, professional counseling for PTSD and other support uh, support groups addiction counseling, um, greenhouse therapy, veterans claims clinics, career services and job training, uh, job placement, financial literacy classes and transportation to and from appointments uh, if needed. Uh, so, um, so today we're actually asking uh, for 650,000 um, to help uh, with the cost to complete renovations uh, to the uh, to the building uh, that we're actually uh, going to be utilized. And we're right now currently on what we call the phase one study, which should be completed um, sometime in mid-April. Um, and uh, we're working alongside with ACDS. Uh, and we did hire um, um, uh, the architects to do the uh, feasibility study and also um, to other sch schematic uh, drawings. So that's the stage that we're in now. And I just wanna say thank you for considering our project. Thank you very much for all your good work. And do we have questions from the members? Just give it a moment. Uh, we have no questions, so you did a great job. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, just uh, for, for our members and, and for those watching, next week we will have our first hearing on a local bill.
as well as remarks from Senator Chris Van Hollen and a presentation from Chesapeake Crossroads Heritage Area and more LBI hearings. So make sure you get your LBIs on the schedule. As a reminder, all presentations are limited to five minutes. Also, we will be holding our delegation photo next Friday after floor, not after the delegation meeting, but after floor. Organizations who wish to be acknowledged can email our delegation secretary at aacd at mlis.state.md.us. And to all our members, I wanted to let you know about an opportunity. Uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the Veterans Cemetery in Crownsville, they will be holding a wreath retirement. These are the, the uh, wreaths across America that were placed on, uh, on the, the grave sites in December. They are retiring those wreaths tomorrow. Uh, so you don't have to RSVP, you can just show up, um, you know, bring, bring clothes you can work in. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for us to give back. So thank you so much, everyone. Do we have any other announcements from our members? With that, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Friday, and we are adjourned. Have a great weekend.